so much for coming back tonight. Um, you may not believe this, but it's actually easier to preach to people than no one. So thank you so much for coming back tonight. Um, John Joe, thanks so much for the music tonight. Um, I think it's always good to kind of mix it up. I think sometimes we can get into a, r- a routine and we sing the songs, we don't even realize what we're singing. Um, I firmly believe that worship is learning something about God or taking something that you already know about God and then praising him for that. So therefore, if we're not paying attention to the words we're singing, then we're just, we're just singing. There's really no true worship there. So I think it's great sometimes just to mix it up a little bit to truly think about what we're singing. Tonight, if you have your Bibles, go to Joshua chapter 7, to the Old Testament tonight. Joshua chapter 7. Um, once again, I appreciate the opportunity of being up here, and um, I hope that tonight's sermon is an encouragement to you guys. Joshua chapter 7. Well, when I was, um, I was going into fourth grade, and my father and my mother came at that time, and there was just three of us, there's three kids, um, now there's five, at the time there's just three, and I was going to a Christian school at that point, from kindergarten through third grade, I had all my buddies, all my friends, everything I could ever want as a kid, my, my family lived in that town, then one day my father and my, my mother set us down in the living room, and they began to explain to us that we are going to sell our house, sell most of our belongings, and we're going to move out to Colorado to help start a church plant. And as a fourth grader, it's like my whole world flipped upside down. But then as I got to Colorado, I loved it. We got to do a lot of cool things. If you've never been to Colorado, make that one of your vacations. Whether it's just hiking the mountain trails or seeing all the beautiful rocks, there's a lot of cool things to do in Colorado. You also meet a lot of people who... Um, are very intellectual. They have really high-paying jobs, whether for the military or whatever. And there was actually a man that went to that church that we were helping at, and he was one of those people that specifically designed those rover vehicles like you see on Mars, like when they land on Mars, those like robots that drive across Mars. He was one of those people who like helped design that. Um, and when you're talking to him, you could recognize he's like one of the smartest people you probably have ever met in your entire life. He was a genius. But one time, my, my mom and dad's Sunday school class had a class party where they were, we were going bowling. The bowling place was probably about 20 minutes away. We had to hop on the highway. And I, as a kid, was in, infatuated with talking to this man. He had a lot of cool stories about how he would build certain things. So I asked my parents if I could ride with him. They said, yeah, of course. So we're about 10 minutes into the ride. We're going down the highway in, in, in Colorado. There's mountains everywhere. He's like, you see that mountain right there? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you're talking about. He goes, look at the very top of the mountain. So I'm like going like this, looking at the car window. He's like, you see that satellite on the top of that mountain? I was like, oh, yeah, I see. Like, there's this huge satellite. But if you weren't paying attention, you'd completely miss it. He goes, do you know why that satellite is there? I was like, no, like, this is, this is going to be cool. Please tell me. I, was, I love talking to this guy. He goes, believe it or not. He goes, inside that mountain is a military base. I said, no way. Like, as a kid, this was the coolest thing. It's like something you see in movies. Like, no way. And then he's like, some people believe there's actually a hidden road that's underground at least from the Denver airport to this mountain range. I was like, that is like the coolest thing ever. In our lives, there's a lot of secret things that might be pretty cool. There's people everywhere who search for treasure or they search up those old coins and World War II um, artifacts in in the Civil War. And People are infatuated with finding things that were supposed to be kept in secret. One of the biggest hidden secrets ever created was the Manhattan Project. During World War II, the Americans set out to um, build the first ever nuclear bomb. I looked up an article just to see how, to what extent the American people went to hide this specific building of the nuclear bomb. It says that it was, despite employing 130,000 people, being conducted in 30 different sites and running up a bill of over $2 billion, which would be equivalent of around $27 billion today, Shockingly, the United States developed an atomic bomb with near perfect secrecy. And you think about all the time and effort and money that was put into building this project, but yet they were allowed and they were able to build this without not too many people knowing about it. And then when we dropped the atomic bomb, the whole world was put on notice of America's power. I'm scared tonight, though, that maybe some of the biggest secrets that have ever been kept in this world are hidden sins in the life of everyday believers. 
So here in Joshua chapter 7, I want to take a little look at the effects of hidden sin in the life of a believer. Here we are in Joshua chapter 7. Let's look at verse 21 real quick. Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, and the Bible says this. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent in the silver under it. We probably have all heard the story since we were a kid. It's the story of Achan. Um, This is taking place right after they blew their trumpets and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. One of the greatest victories they have ever had as a nation as they walked through the wilderness and they crossed the Jordan River. They said, no way, look at the size of Jericho, but yet with God's help and with a couple musical instruments, that wall came tumbling down. But then we get to chapter 7 and something takes place that some of us may not expect. Like if we're watching a sports game, we see the very best team going against the worst team, we automatically assume that the best team is going to win. Not too often in professional sports do you see the best team lose to the worst team. But this is exactly what takes place in chapter 7. Go ahead and read with me. Um, You can follow along. Look at verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass of the accursed thing, For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, and of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethaven, of the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. So Joshua is, going, is already looking ahead to the next battle. After Jericho was a place called Ai. And he sends spies there to figure out how they're going to go about defeating this nation. But unbeknownst to him, there was sin in the camp of Israel. Then look at verse 3. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor labor thither, for they are but few. So the word gets back, hey, Ai is nothing compared to Jericho. Hey, hey, Joshua, I think we could go in there with just a couple thousand people and take care of them. You don't have to send the entire army. We can take care of this. And then as they went on, it says in verse 4, So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto um, Shebarim, and spoke them in the going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. The children of Israel thought this was an easy victory. They thought they had everything under control. God just gave us Jericho. But yet they go up against a small town of Ai and 36 men die. See, when things aren't going the way you might expect them to in your Christianity, it may be time for us to take a moment and look on the inward parts of our lives and say, is there hidden sin that is unconfessed? The first point I want to look at tonight is, You may be living in disobedience when you disobey clear demands from God. If you have your Bibles, go back to chapter 6, so we're in chapter 7, go back to um, chapter 6 and look at verse 18. This is before they go into Jericho. Look what it says here in verse 18. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall keep into the treasury of the Lord. See, Achan had no excuse. Before he saw that that garment, before he saw that gold and that silver, in his mind he probably thought back to what was spoken of in verse 18, saying, you know what? The only thing I'm allowed to grab is some gold and silver that I can use for the worship of the Lord. If I'm taking it for myself, I have clear demands not to take of it. Achan had no excuse, but what we see in his life is he disobeyed 
an easy order to understand. James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We, we read that verse, and it's, it's an easy thing to read, but a hard thing to live out, right? To be doers of the word and not just hearers only. In my opinion, I think um, when it comes to teenagers, because I know this is probably true because of my own life, this is the hardest thing to do. Some teenagers are forced to come to church because their parents make them. Others come to church maybe just to be with their friends. But yet the entire time they go, they hear for four to five to six years, they're at church, and they hear sermon after sermon, and they hear it, and they hear it, and they hear it, but never once do they actually do it. And then when the time comes for them to move on to college or to find a job and they move out of the house, man, it hits them like that, like, oh, man, I'm no longer forced to go to church. i got to figure out what my own beliefs are. Here, Achan was told exactly what to do. He heard the order, but it was another thing to actually obey the order. You could say, well, maybe Achan had some pretty good excuses. Achan could have said, well, man, I marched around that city seven days. I deserve something from it. Achan maybe have said, well, man, uh, you know, I was there the whole time. I deserved this, and, and it was just a little bit. I didn't take an entire wagon of stuff. It was just a little bit. You could see the excuses that could pile up in Achan's mind. But at the end of the day, he disobeyed a clear demand from God. The Bible says, him that knoweth to do good, and then to doeth it not, to him it is sin. You may be living a life that has hidden sin inside of you when you begin to disobey clear and cut demands that God has given us. You think, how could someone that goes to church their entire life just stop going? Maybe because there's some sin in their life that's hindering their relationship with God, and they begin to disobey those clear demands. So number one, we see you may have some sin in your life when you begin to disobey clear demands from God. But secondly, I see you begin to ignore Separ- you begin to ignore the separation between you and God. What do you mean by that? Okay, go back to chapter 7. Go back to chapter 7, and I read these verses right from 2 through 5. Joshua says, okay, let's go against Ai. Let's get this done. And they walk into battle, and 36 men die. I, can Im- I-, I would love to be in the mind of Achan. When that army comes retreating back, and then we hear that we lost to Ai of all people. I wonder if deep down inside, Achan was like, oh man, that was my fault. I hope no one finds out. See, Achan knew exactly what he did wrong. And in my opinion, Achan knew exactly the reason they lost that battle. But yet he was ignoring the separation that was between him and God. See, not only does sin affect your own life, Sin also has consequences for other people. Um, I think of, I remember playing football in high, in high school, and during football season, there was always a rule from our coach that no one was allowed to drink pop. Okay, I apologize. No one is allowed to drink soda. We, we say soda down here, all right? I'm still getting used to that. You're not allowed to drink soda during the season. It's bad for you, and you won't stay conditioned, and you get fat, and, 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 and uh, it makes you dehydrated. And we had, he, they gave us a bunch of reasons not to do that. But then, after football practice, we'd go out to eat to, you know, whatever such and such restaurant with our teammates, and you see all your teammates ordering soda. You're like, okay, what is more important here? Us winning the game, us obeying our coach, or you doing what you want to do? And this is exactly what's happening in Aiken's life. Aiken cared more about what he wanted than he cared about his relationship with God and his relationship with other Israelites. And Achan is sitting here, and he, he's causing 36 people to die. But you know it wasn't just 36 people that died. There's now probably 36 wives who don't have a husband. There's maybe around 70-some kids who now won't have a father the rest of their life because of one man's hidden sin. If you have your Bibles real quickly, go, go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah chapter 59, I'll let you get there. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and it goes on and so forth. Isaiah, Isaiah 59, and look at verse um, 1. Isaiah 59, verse 1, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Well, what's going on in this passage? 
people began to complain that the reason that, that they're still in bondage, the reason that they're still having hardships, it must be that God's hand, his power, has been shortened. That God's no longer as powerful as he once was. Or maybe it's God's ear, it's heavy. Maybe God can't hear us as much as he used to. Maybe that's what's going on. But then look at verse 2. But your iniquities, your, your sin, have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Is it amazing that we will get to the point where we actually begin to question God and how much he cares for us before we ourselves look on the inside and actually take care of what the real problem is? Oh, it's got to be God that he doesn't love me anymore. Well, no, maybe it's that there's sin in your life. And because of that sin, God is not able to hear you. Um, I... I read um, a quote from a, a pastor, and it says this. Sin separates us from fellowship with God because at the point of our sin, we no longer think alike with God. Sin separates us from the blessing of God because at the point of our sin, we are not trusting God and relying on him. Sin separates us um, from some of the benefits of God, just like the prodigal son this morning, because the prodigal son was still loved by the father, but yet enjoyed the benefits of his love when he was, sorry, he didn't enjoy the benefits of his love when he was in sin. Well, I think sometimes we come to this idea that sin's okay. That because I have a little bit of sin in my life, I'm still able to live my life as a Christian as like I'm supposed to. Remember what happened when Jesus was on the cross and all the sin was placed on Jesus? Do you remember what God the Father had to do? He had to turn his head. Why? Because even though that was his son, it was Jesus, and Jesus was still God, and he was perfect. It was the fact that sin was placed on him that God had to turn away. So if God the Father had to turn away from the sin placed on Jesus, how much more do you think he turns away when we have sin in our life? Amen. Maybe there's some defeats going on in your life and you feel like this, you get no traction anymore as a Christian. Maybe it's time to, God, is there something in my life that I have not yet confessed to you? But then to ignore it would cause problems for other people like we've seen in this story. So number one, we quickly see that there is a disobedient to a clear demand from God. But number two, we see that there was an uh, ignorance of separation between you and God. And then number three, we see it there, we begin to hurt the name of God. That when you have hidden sin in your life, you actually become a stumbling block to other people. Say, Pastor Ethan, where in the world are you pulling this from the story? All right, I'll explain it. If you, if you went all the way back, you can turn, if you want, to Joshua chapter 2. This is the story of Rahab. And this is what Rahab said in chapter 2 and verse 10. I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt. And when what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. Rahab's like, hey, everyone on this side of Jordan has heard about your God. We've heard how he's led you through a Red Sea. Like what God can do that? We've heard how God sent down manna from heaven and, and supplied all your needs. We have heard about you guys, and everyone is terrified because they know there will be nothing other more than them being utterly destroyed by your God. That's a pretty cool testimony. Imagine walking into work and everyone sees you, and they say, wow, God is with them, and there's nothing we can do to bring him down. That's a pretty cool testimony to have. But then because of the sin in Achan's life, the Israelites walk into Ai and get utterly destroyed by this small town. And then look what Joshua says in chapter 7. Look at verses 8 and 9. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before the enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, 
and shall environ us round and cut off our name um, from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy great name? He's saying, what am I going to tell people? What are we going to do when everyone hears of this? They will recognize that Israel can be defeated. See, when you have hidden sin in your life, you begin to hurt the name of God. When you walk into, the, into work, can your coworkers tell that what you believe on Sunday is not exactly what you believe on Monday? When they used to cuss around you and they, and they used to say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that around you. But now it's just an openly you laugh at their, their bad jokes. Maybe it's time for you to take a second and say, God, is there some hidden sin in my life that I'm ignoring? And because of that, I'm beginning to hurt your name. Um, imagine with me for a second how you might impact your workplace or how you might impact your Christian school or how you might impact your public school if you were sincerely clean before God wanting nothing more to than represent his name. The Bible tells us that we are light and salt. Do you know with light, the only reason darkness exists is when light is not present. Because when there's light there, there is nothing that darkness can do to overcome that light. That's why the Bible says if there's a light and it sitteth on a hill, the whole world can see it because of that one light. There's nothing that darkness can do to knock down that light. But when light is then hid by its own darkness, darkness wins. But number four, as we continue on with this story, you begin, um, you become okay with the world's materialistic mentality. Look at verse 20. We read it earlier. Or sorry, verse 21. This is Achan speaking here. He's like, when I saw among the spoils of a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. See, you may have some hidden sin in your life when you become okay with stealing stuff from the world. As a Christian, what have you adopted from the world that you know should not be in your life? Is it a certain TV show that makes way too many jokes that hurts the name of Jesus Christ? Is it a certain genre of music that does, that does nothing but make fun of what we believe here in this auditorium? Maybe it's a certain mentality of how we need to raise our kids so that we don't look weird to the outside world. I'm not sure what it is that we may have stolen from the world. But if we are doing that on a, on a day-to-day basis, it may be a clear sign that there is sin in our life that we have ignored. And because of that, we no longer have a conscience like we used to have. Aiken's like, yeah, I saw that garment, I saw that gold, and I have that silver. Even though I know it was wrong, I kept looking at it, and man, it caught my attention. And then from there, there's nothing I could do about it. But you can tell he knew what it was wrong. Why? Because he hid it. It's like that kid in the cookie jar. Oh, I didn't eat it. And it's like there's just signs all over the place. But that kid tries to hide it the best he can, right? Because he knows it's wrong. And then finally, this is how I like to close this sermon. I think hopefully this point pulls everything together. You may have some hidden sin in your life when there is no conviction whatsoever. Look at verse 21 again. I just read it. He takes the, he takes the silver, the gold, the garment. He says, I, I, I wanted it. He goes, I coveted over it. But never once do we see Achan going, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Hey, no, don't, please don't stone me. I, I promise I'll make it up. Hey, I'm so sorry for my sin. Never once do we see this from Achan. Do you know that there is a difference between guilt and conviction? Guilt says, how will this hurt me? Conviction says, how will this hurt God? And there's a difference there that I think sometimes we miss. In the Bible, when Moses saw the Egyptian whipping one of those Jews, and before Moses went, and murdered that Egyptian. Do you know what the Bible says what Moses did? 
The Bible says that Moses, Moses looked this way. Moses looked that way. And he made sure the coast was clear before he went and did something he knew he should not have done. Oh, was that, was that conviction of him saying, oh, can, should I do this or not? No, no, that was guilt. He was saying, hey, before I do this, I want to make sure that this won't hurt me in my life. No, I'm good. Okay, I'm going to do it. Guilt says that when you're home by yourself doing something you should not be doing, it's, is my mom or dad home? Oh, is my wife or is my husband home? No, okay, I'm good to go. Because I'm more worried about how it's going to hurt me if I get caught more than it hurts my relationship with God. Well, then what does conviction look like? I think one of the greatest explanations of, of um, conviction in the Bible is Joseph. When, Potiphar, when Potiphar's wife comes to him and she says, hey, lay with me, and she begins to come after him, what does Joseph immediately do? Runs the other direction. He doesn't go, oh, is Potiphar home? Am I going to get in trouble? Am I going to get thrown back in prison? Okay, no, Potiphar's wife, we're, we're good to go. No, no. Because he was more concerned how this sin may affect his relationship with God more so than being embarrassed by Potiphar's wife. See, we may have some hidden sin in our life. If we're always looking over our shoulder, will I get away with this without getting in trouble? More so than, God, I know you can see me no matter where I am. God, you're right. God, I memorized this scripture. Help me get over this. Okay, thank you, God. There's a difference between guilt and conviction. Then we finish up the story. Look down with me in verse 26. This is how the story ends sadly. Verse 26, and Joshua adjured them at that time. Oh, sorry, I'm in, verse, I'm in chapter 6. Chapter 7, verse 26. Here we go. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Finally, the camp of Israel had the stone aching because of his, his sin. So at the end of this sermon, if there is some hidden sin in your life, and maybe tonight something went off in your head, you know what? There's a sin I keep ignoring. I got I to gotta do something about it. What do I need to do about it? It's time to go to that sin and stone it. It's, it's time to stop playing with it. It's time time to stop looking over your shoulder just hoping you get another day of this sin without getting in trouble. It's time to go into that sin and completely destroy it because in your life, the only thing that matters is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads, no one looking around.